Welcome to Cross-Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from U.S. tax reform to the OECD's latest developments. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's U.S. International Tax Services Leader. You can follow me on Twitter at Exporter Tax. On this week's episode of Cross-Border Tax Talks, I'm excited to be joined by Alex Velashko. Alex is an international tax partner in PwC's Washington National Tax Services practice and the leader of our value chain transformation practice. Alex, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Doug. It's good to be back. So, Alex, what I wanted to start with before we dive into the number of things that we're seeing from an operational perspective and the tax implications related to just really major disruptions around the globe is start with the term value chain. Um, there may be a number of our listeners, non-tax folks, or, or frankly, even tax professionals. I, I was always mystified kind of earlier in my career, kind of what is a value chain? And we hear a lot about the supply chain. I want to talk a little bit about demand chain, but how would you define what the what the value chain is or what a value chain is? Great question, Doug. Um, a value chain is um, a collection of capabilities that allows you know a company, a business enterprise to make money. I mean, that's really the simple definition. Um, an example of a value chain for a products company, for example, would be something that begins with, you know, market insights, goes into the R&D, you know, innovation process, makes its way into the supply chain, you know, the, the system that decides the, the balancing of supply and demand, you know, has the product manufactured or sourced, you know, moving it to the, to the markets and ultimately selling. Uh, it in the markets and then the, that sort of circle of life repeats itself. So that's an example of a value chain for a products company, you know, and then of course there could be a similar example in the services business, you know, something that begins with um, understanding, you know, clients demand to, you know, designing, developing solutions, capabilities, tools, models, and then deploying um, professionals to actually render services. So those are examples of the value chain. It's the way our clients make money. I, I love that. That's a great definition. One of the things, Alex, you know, that was always perplexing to me was that I think sometimes the term supply chain and value chain are used interchangeably. And I mean, maybe it's the tax nerd in me, but I'm like, well, that's I, I, that's not technically correct, right? The way the way at least I think about the value chain is that it's beyond just the supply piece. It's all the ways that a company makes it's the money end to, to end. a point. Yeah. It's the end to end. And the supply chain is is really the beginning of that. And particularly um, in, 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 a, in a product type industry, the demand chain is also very important, right? And so that's the way I tend to think of things as far as the overall value chain, but we have the supply chain, which is how does a product get initiated and then ultimately to market? Right. And then the the demand chain is like, OK, once that that supply, once we've gotten that product to as close to the customer as we can, how do we then take that next step to get it to the customer from the marketer, from the salesperson or, or whatever? And then there are a variety of different intangibles, if you will, and things that are important to both the supply chain and the demand chain that drive how a any particular entity or company can make money. No, exactly. I think uh, like one useful example how management consultants refer to these things as using words innovate, plan, make, source, deliver, and sell, right? Think that's your value chain, okay? And then as Doug, you just said, there are valuable capabilities within each of those elements of the value chain, you know, that could be intangibles, that could be you know, valuable services, functions, et cetera. And supply chain is just a small piece of that. Supply chain is typically something that kind of lives between, you know, planning, uh, sourcing, making, and moving inventory. I mean, that is supply chain. And there is a lot more to that, to the end-to-end -end value chain of a business. Right. And and then the other thing to take this back to, to cross-border tax talks mm -hmm. and the tax side is that there are tax implications to 
every single aspect of, of the value chain, right? From initiating the idea and coming up with the, the concept of a product or a, a, a service, to how it gets made, right? And is there any magic into, and, and how are materials sourced that ultimately get into the product? And then how does a company get the product from manufacturing to sales or to the sales and distribution cycle? And then is there any magic as, as part of the distribution cycle? And so, Every time anything crosses a border, it has tax implications. And then anytime, you know, there's there's a movement of anything, there's then transfer pricing implications, right? As far as insofar as when you're dealing with related parties, how do we make sure that each respective cog in the wheel is appropriately compensated? Mm-hmm. And really the way I think of value chain transformation is really the the combi- from a tax perspective is the combination of that, you know, operations, the tax consequences, which each with each of those pieces of the puzzle. And then from a transfer pricing perspective, it plays a really, really important role as well. Right on, Doug. Doug and, and you know, the, the, um, what you're illustrating here is no two companies are alike. We're really just talking about unique DNA that every company has, you know, when somebody says, just give me the playbook, you know, like what are the things I should be doing? Just think about all the intricacies you just highlighted. You know, all those elements are unique to every company, no two alike. You know, there's some themes, but uh, you really need to be very attuned to the way our clients operate in order to provide meaningful advice. Absolutely. And and there has been a lot of disruption in, in 2020. Um, I think there's a lot of a hope um, for, for a vaccine and an economic recovery shortly thereafter as that gets distributed. But, you know, a lot of big changes, not just as a result of COVID-19, um, but the, obviously the economic impact. And then even before COVID-19, and this seems like an eternity ago, um, you know, the changes to trade policy from a U.S. perspective and just a whole lot of change for, for, for taxpayers to deal with that, that impact their value chain. And so wanted to go through a, a few of the things that, that we've seen happen in 2020 and that, you know, the thinking about the prospective for 2021. And what I wanted to start with, Alex, is supply chain disruption. There have been a number of macroeconomic factors, geopolitical factors. We think about China's involvement with Hong Kong. We think about trade policy, a lot of these that we've covered um, on the cross-border tax talks. What have you seen uh, both from how countries are reacting and how companies are reacting with respect to the the disruption in the in the supply chain? And, and is everybody and, and then I'll already spoil the follow up question. Is everybody moving all their manufacturing back to the U.S.? But we, we can work our way to that. Yeah, sure. Like w- what a year it's been. Um, it's just absolutely crazy. Um, and the the supply chain executives, you know, the guys and gals that run. Uh, the supply chains of our clients are really in a hot seat. Uh, we've seen a ton of um, just highly disrupted supply chains for a variety of reasons. You know, some of them you've you've just mentioned. You know, obviously the the trade and tariffs were already a big source of disruption um, as companies were reacting to potentially significant new costs in the system, trying to figure out how to deal with that. The um, the pandemic just brought elements of the the, the global logistics supply chain to a standstill. And just because how global everything has become and how integrated supply chains have become uh, an interruption in one element just brought to their knees entire supply chains of clients. We have numerous examples where, you know, maybe the factories, you know, were able to produce. And China is a great example that China recovered fairly quickly from, you know, COVID pandemic and reopened the factories. But the, the ocean freight was disrupted or the warehouses in Europe went down, right? And so that just really brings down the entire system to its knees. Um, so, so all those factors are very much in play. Uh, there's a number of these kind of shorter term events that happened or are happening. And uh, these uh, shorter term events are really causing companies to rethink whether they have the right models, you know, capabilities for the long run. I mean, what this is really highlighting is some of the, um, the the themes that Doug you just mentioned like are we is our supply chain too stretched you know is our source of you know raw material or production too far from the markets that we serve or are we too reliant on one particular country of origin or one particular manufacturing site and if that thing goes down our whole business goes down with it or 
you know, are we too vulnerable to the, the sort of cross-border trade war between, you know, U.S. and China, which is capturing or, you know, causing collateral damage in a number of other, you know, global markets. So all those things are very much in play. <clears throat> and then, um, Doug, as you mentioned, uh, it's interesting, your question about um, disruption and the impacts on the on supply chains. Um, it, it really is helpful to think of the, the change in disruption, you know, first from a perspective of, you know, governments. Um, there are certain things that are really changing, you know, from the government standpoint. There are certain things happening that are changing companies, you know, response. And then there are certain things that are, you know, happening that are changing people's behaviors. And we have to think about all those, you know, elements and how they affect the, the company's tax costs. Yeah, and and each one of those changes has a, a tax consequence, right? And so one of the things that's been interesting to me, Alex, and you certainly spend a lot more time in the space, is just how long these uh, these supply chains are. And and maybe that's not the right term because I guess the supply chain itself can be relatively short, but these are things that have been put in over decades, and. To be able to change something like where a company has relied heavily, let's say, on Southeast Asia for their manufacturing, to try to then move that manufacturing to another similarly costed, you know, maybe it's closer, so Central America or Mexico or another alternative, those are massive changes, right? And now we can deal with it as tax advisors and like we can understand what the tax consequences are, uh, but it, it's been surprising to me how how long that 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 takes, I guess, to, to be able to effectuate those those changes. And then, you know, the the tax policy and tax policies in various jurisdictions continues to change so so dramatically and so so quickly too that you know how do companies kind of manage the well we know we're going to want to change the supply chain from a longer term basis mm -hmm. and then how do we try to manage those tax costs given the uncertain environment yeah it's really interesting there's a lot there it's a very loaded question um you know the one thing doug that's interesting um and like you i've been doing this for, for a long time um I, I really i'm trying to like remember i don't think i've ever seen a company that would have made a decision to establish you know a manufacturing site or some you know massive you know footprint investment in a particular place because of taxes i mean it just really doesn't happen despite you know some of the publicity or despite you know some of a popular belief there's so much more goes into these fundamental kind of network planning decisions it's things like cost structure it's things like access to qualified labor it's things like access to uh, production capabilities at the right scale. Uh, it's things like lead times and reliability. It's, you know, environmental and regulatory considerations. Like those are the things that motivate companies to organize their business footprint in a particular manner. You know, of course, there is, you know, tax cost, there is income tax cost, and then there is indirect tax cost, you know, customs and VAT, for example. Uh, and those are part of the equation, but they are like way down the list. Um, and this is the reason, uh, Doug, you're right, these decisions have, you know, a very long uh, lead time. Uh, and there's a lot of consequences to changing the course on how you organize your uh, supply chain, your, your um, operating footprint. Um, we certainly seeing some trends. I mean, there are trends that are discernible. I think companies are concerned about um overall reliance on china mainland as you know the the primary or only source of supply for critical uh components or critical inputs uh we definitely see companies wanting to diversify um both in terms of potentially having backup countries of origin as well as just um did kind of disintegrating their uh, supply chain so not being as vertically integrated in one country but perhaps you know still producing certain critical inputs in china as an example, but then setting up, you know, um, assembly or integration location, locations elsewhere, maybe closer to the, the markets. Um, there's definitely um, a trend to kind of near shore, not quite necessarily always onshore, but at least near shore, some capabilities. Uh, a big reason for that uh, is um, the, uh, there's a lot of pressure to shorten the lead times. Um, and a lot of us as consumers have grown to expect that you can, you know, very quickly have something customized, made, shipped, and delivered to your door. Uh, so in response to that, companies are certainly looking at, you know, near shoring certain activities closer to the key markets. Um, 
that's the reason why, for example, uh, North America has been beneficial, not just the U.S., but, you know, Mexico and Canada have been beneficiaries of some of these trends. Um, so the, the short answer, Doug, I think um, these are definitely long lead time decisions. There are definitely trends that are discernible. But um, what many don't realize, um, China of today is not the China of, you know, yesterday or, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago. Um, it's, a, it's a massive economy with uh, tremendous you know capabilities and resources uh, not just on the supply chain side but also on the demand side it's just a huge uh and uh, quickly growing market for goods and services um and there are things that are existing in that country uh, on a scale that is just unimaginable uh, and really really difficult to compete so i think we will continue to see our companies heavily invested you know in china both as a supply uh, point as well as a market for their you know goods and services, but we are going to see some of these other trends you know in terms of um, additional operating locations, you know, uh, nearshoring of certain activities closer to the key markets, uh, and building in redundancies. Yeah, and your your point, Alex, which really resonated, is that you're right. Tax is just one piece of the equation, and I think sometimes it's viewed as like the the primary reason that certain companies look to go offshore for their manufacturing. And, and there have been obviously a number of significant tax policy changes to, to influence these decisions, but I, it's not really tax policy that is going to make that decision, generally speaking, to, to onshore or offshore. Now, as we think about some of the tax changes over the course of the last year, um, with respect to supply chain specifically, the Whirlpool case uh, was has, I think, shaken a lot of us uh, and caused us to question our historic interpretation of the, the branch rules. We had a podcast dedicated to that, but I think that has certainly caused a lot of us to, to think and rethink what are the, the U.S. tax implications of some of these foreign supply chains. We've seen a number of changes outside the, the U.S., um, particularly in Europe, um, the anti-tax avoidance directive, for example, and their treatment of various types of payments as we think about global supply chain. I think about the proposed rule in Mexico um, with respect to some of the changes about how they tax employees for their services companies. So all of these really play a role. None typically will, will absolutely drive the business to, to, to make that decision, but a, a lot of big changes from a tax perspective we've seen this year, if you want to comment on that. <clears throat> uh, sure. Um, there's... Um... Just tremendous amount of change and disruption and all these different elements that you're highlighting. Um, maybe just to to think of um, a couple of these as examples. So from the the countries, you know, the government's perspective, um, we definitely see um, huge focus on um, increasing um, you know tax collections. Countries are faced with deficits as a result of dealing with pandemic. Countries were already um, recognizing that they not collecting as much revenue as they would like to see with respect to the sales in their particular markets. So the one thing we're seeing is just a tremendous um, incremental focus, attention, scrutiny from um, countries all around the world on increasing their uh, tax revenue, tax collections. And they're doing it in a variety of ways. They're increasing their headline tax rates. Um, they are uh, making it more challenging to claim, you know, deductions, reductions to the tax base. They are changing their trade, you know, rules and regulations. They are uh, tweaking their um, currency exchange controls. This basically this whole theme of kind of incremental tax cost and continuing economic nationalism. So that's one thing that we clearly are seeing. Um, but the other thing we're seeing is just tremendous um, additional visibility that uh, governments all around the world have into the affairs of cross-border businesses. I mean, it just become a new reality. Um, we now have country by country reporting. We now have um, automated access to tax filings as they're being made and uh, data analytics being used by governments to automatically crunch that data and you know, throw out red flags, which then you know, trigger exams, you know, audit activity. We're seeing, um, we're seeing great examples where taxing authorities, both between countries and authorities within countries responsible for different tax matters, talk to one another and compare notes. You know, it's, for example, become very common to see, you know, VAT authorities uh, talking to income tax authorities and trying to come up with um, 
kind of integrated audits. Uh, same thing on, from the payroll tax perspective, a lot of information exchange. So if we just pause there, what we're really seeing is a picture where there's a lot of scrutiny, attention, focus on increasing tax collection for multinational businesses, um, enabled by great access to data, uh, information, visibility, and just a broad array of tools that governments have, whether it's, you know, laws that exist or some of the things that have been proposed, you know, we're seeing companies just using, kind of grabbing those and using that toolbox um, to try to increase their uh, collection of their share of the, the company's profits. So, so that's that's one trend, you know, again, from the from the government's perspective. Um, and then, Doug, from the, you know, as we just talked about, from the um, company's perspective, just rethinking, um, rethinking parts of the uh, business, as we just talked about, in response to these various disruptions, uh, all of that is really causing fresh look at, you know, are we, are we still operating efficiently? Is the operating model, so the collection of, you know, entity structure, transaction flows, um, intercompany economic allocations of income and costs, all of that is what we call operating model. Is it fit for purpose? That's been a topic du jour in um, all kinds of meetings happening at the C-suite uh, and on down. That's been a big, big focus. Uh, a lot of disruption and just fundamental questions about revisiting uh, operating models. Yeah, so let's go to that because I think that's been a number, a, a big theme. The, the one thing I want, one point I wanted to add on kind of the list of various weapons, if you will, that we're seeing various territories and, and governments use is the digital service taxes. I think you alluded to that, mm -hmm. but wanted to make sure that we mentioned that that's been another one that has then had a domino effect of impacting trade policy and and, and everything else that I know a number of uh, our listeners have been, have been impacted by. So Let's move then to what has definitely been a, a theme that I, was probably some time coming after a very strong economy and then probably induced by COVID-19 is the, the, the desire to take costs out of the system, right? And, and simplify. And so I think, you know, a, across a variety of industries, including the, the one, including our own, right? It's been a fundamental change. I mean, as like you, I, I traveled five days a week, you know, before, before March and have been firmly planted in this chair for, you know, ever since. So companies are really looking at, you know, how they do business, how they deal with their clients, how they deal with their customers. Um, what are some of the trends that you've seen with respect to, to simplification or fit for growth, as we call it, mm -hmm. um, or, or cost takeout? And, and how is that impacting uh, companies and, and tax profiles? Yeah, there, there's a lot of deferred, deferred sort of maintenance, unaddressed opportunity mm -hmm. that have accumulated at a lot of our clients, a lot of cross-border businesses. Um, a lot of these, like we mentioned, this concept of an operating model, right, which is just a collection of, you know, entity structure, you know, transactional flows, contracting arrangements, you know, transpricing policy, and so forth. Those, those models have been put in place many, many years ago in the world that looked very different than the world as, as, we, as we know it now. Um, there's a lot of uh, opportunity in simplifying those models. Um, and we actually saw in this year in 2020, um, many global businesses taking an opportunity of a crisis to go and do some housekeeping, basically try to address those divert maintenance, maintenance issues and in, uh, in hopes of emerging kind of leaner, more resilient, more productive businesses. Uh, some examples of that. So. One example we're seeing is companies um, harnessing um, data analytics and automation to take out complexity and simplify just a lot of very basic data intensive you know, processes within their operations. Um, so that's been a huge emphasis. A lot of those capabilities are widely available. Um, they, uh, they can be put in place fairly quickly and they just result in not just the cost takeout, but just much, much higher efficiency of operating and enabling business transactions to be processed. So that's one. Um, the other area of focus have been <clears throat> at um, reducing transactional complexity. Uh, that's a huge focus. As you, as you think about the uh, typical multinational enterprise that has a network of you know, manufacturing companies, it has different maybe supply points, that transact with those manufacturers, and then it has a network of distributors all around the world, you know, third parties, and 
their own affiliates. You, you can just imagine the, the spaghetti of transactions that that system requires. And all those transactions need to be you know, maintained, priced. Um, there's tax compliance associated with a lot of those cross-border flows, you know, from income tax or indirect tax perspective. There is the, the system complexity, you know, IT system complexity that's needed to maintain it. So there's a huge opportunity as it relates to those um, transactional models to simplify. Um, and we're seeing a lot of uh, interest and appetite, for example, to um, setting up models where maybe manufacturers are um, just made to refocus on the key things they control, which is conversion costs, you know, labor and overhead. A lot of times the sourcing for key categories of spent has already been centralized globally, regionally. So we're basically seeing more and more, for example, the so-called toll manufacturing models, you know, manufacturing as a service. That's one example of that. We're seeing on the demand side of the business more and more interest in the models where there is a, um, a master distributor or a single sales entity may be transacting with customers. Like many companies went and asked the question, do we really need to have, you know, 37 affiliates in Europe or in the EMEA region, you know, booking their own revenue? And the answer is not really. Um, there's really no compelling commercial or regulatory reason why you must operate that way. And so companies using that as an opportunity to ask these tough questions and, um, and simplify, simplify and reduce complexity and cost. Uh, and this has been a big year for that. And I expect 2021 will continue that trend. If anything, now um, there's a bit of a peer competition, you know, for these sort of streamlined, you know, more automated, digitally enabled, you know, simpler operating models. Um, and then, Doug, of course, from our standpoint, there is uh, tax consequences, both as a defensive matter, as well as the opportunities associated with all those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would be remiss, you know, if we went through an entire cross-border tax talks where I did mention the term guilty. And so what, what comes to mind as you are talking about, particularly taking some of the costs out, is we've been and had Mike Gerson on a, a few episodes ago to talk about the new foreign tax credit, the final and proposed foreign tax credit rules. Well, stewardship, the how stewardship gets allocated for purposes of determining what foreign tax credits a company gets for guilty. We, we've spent a lot of time on the, the podcast talking about interest expense and stewardship can have a very similar impact on a U.S. multinational that is paying a significant amount of foreign tax on their guilty income and yet can still pay U.S. tax because of expense apportionment. And then stewardship becomes a piece of that. And so as companies are thinking about taking costs out, right, there's a, a transfer pricing element of, okay, well, what costs, for example, that are, remain in the U.S. should be charged out, and then what's left, what's directly allocable, what should be apportioned? And so, you know, as, as taxpayers are, are thinking about taking costs out, I also think there's a strategic opportunity to, to think about, well, how should those costs be allocated? What are some of the tax implications, even from a foreign tax credit perspective that could be impacted like that? And then, of course, the other tax implications that you mentioned, which I think are probably more obvious to our listeners of just like, okay, where should income be earned? What are the key value drivers in intellectual property that, um, that, that need to be rewarded? And then how do you structure the the, the distribution chain, for example, the demand chain to, to try to manage tax risks. And there, there's also an element to that that I feel like it's, it's a little bit like fashion. You know, it comes in and out of style as far as commission type arrangements and, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, buy, buy sell arrangements. And part of it is if you wait around long enough, it's going to be in fashion again. But a, a, a number Absolutely. of tax opportunities as well as pitfalls as companies are even thinking about, you know, trying to simplify transactions or just trying to take costs out. Yeah, absolutely, Doug. And you know what, what's interesting is we just talked about a lot of moving pieces, right? Just, you know, companies' value chains are complex, you know, the operating models, you know, are very complicated. There's all these changes happening and companies living that change every day, either because they are digitizing or because they're taking costs out or because their supply mm -hmm. chain is in disarray, needs to be modified. Uh, what's interesting is we see tax authorities taking notice. Um, and um, really engaging, you know, with companies um, a lot of times in the context of controversy uh, or even litigation um, around how did the companies behave when these sort of business changes took place. This is a really important lesson um, as business 
changes, business evolves, uh, those different elements of the value chain are being revisited or modified. Um, this would be something that will be looked at by tax authorities around the world, uh, looking for evidence on, you know, what were the value drivers? You know, what do the contracts say? How did the companies behave? How were the transactions booked? Who bore the costs? Uh, how did the risk materialize? And when it materialized, who bore that risk? who made the decisions relating to how to deploy, you know, assets or what to invest in. Or, you know, those are all the things that we, we as uh, tax practitioners need to be thinking about in uh, making sure our companies are at least acknowledging as uh, important telltales of kind of true, you know, behaviors within an enterprise, because that will get looked at. And I think that's a perfect transition to the next topic is that, you know, as companies have designed their value chains and as we think about trying to do it efficiently from a tax perspective, a lot of that is driven based on where people are doing certain activities, right? So to the extent that we have key, you know, significant people functions, as we often refer to that, and key DEMPI functions in a, a jurisdiction, those jurisdictions generally should be rewarded with a higher share of those profits. Now, the question that we've gotten a lot during this 2020 year with COVID-19 is like, people can't travel anymore. I think there were a lot of us, I mean, as I, this is the less of an issue in our business, but I'm based out of DC. I live in St. Louis. Um, all that's in the United States, just to remind people. But like in Europe, you know, people can live across borders regularly. And, and oh, yeah. you know, we see that all the time. And uh and, and, you know, with as ubiquitous as airline travel is, has has been pre-COVID, um, what are you seeing with respect, because I know we've gotten a lot of questions of like, well, are we creating PE risk? Are we fundamentally putting at risk our whole strategy and value chain because, you know, these executives or significant people functions are not taking place in the territory? And I think we've even seen some countries that are giving some relief for PE, but, you know, how how are you thinking about that as a challenge and for, for taxpayers? Yeah, it's a tough one. Um, there's a couple of things going on here. One, even before the pandemic, um, the ways of working ha have evolved significantly when all these tax rules were put in place. You know, we're still dealing with fundamentally global tax system that is very focused on activities of individuals as they perform their duties, you know, their decision rights, their roles, responsibilities, and their physical whereabouts when they um, perform their duties. So that's on one hand. On the other hand, we, even before the pandemic, are already living in a world where more and more things take place remotely. We have a lot of process automation and digital tools that allowed people, you know, in different hemispheres being very hands-on and involved in making decision -make decisions. Um, we had um, already a trend to centralize, either regionalize or globalize a lot of key business processes. I mean, that's something that is continuing and I suspect will continue. There is less and less appetite uh, by multinational businesses to have a you know, highly fragmented way of making business decisions. There's a lot of desire to streamline those processes and you know, uh, those decision makers might be in uh, different parts of the globe, all getting together virtually, you know, enabled by technology and making key decisions as committees, as groups of individuals. So there's all those things going on. And just think about the, it's truly a dilemma, you know, definition of a dilemma is something that does not have a, a solution, you know, unlike a problem that has a solution, dilemma doesn't, you just need to manage it. Um, so this is a great example of dilemma that uh, most of our clients are facing. How do we reconcile these commercial realities with the way that the tax rules are written and the way tax authorities uh, are trying to enforce them. And then of course the pandemic came. Um, the, the relief, um, and I know Doug, you and your guests have talked about this before, that the relief relating to the pandemic is very short term and it's very limited. Um, I think companies would be mistaken to get a lot of comfort from that relief. Um, tax authorities, you know, for the reasons that we said earlier, are very motivated by enforcement in um, you know tax revenue collection, so that that relief is not really much of. Um, it's really just about, I think, number one, um, just understanding the commercial reality. What are the key, most economically significant decisions 
that are important in the context of each of the elements of the value chain of our business? That's the first question, you know, really understanding that. The second question is, now that we understand those key decision points, how, how are those decisions made? Are they made by individuals? Are they made by groups of individuals? You know, a lot of times there's more than one individual in, involved in making those decisions. Just understanding and, and just documenting, getting our heads around that dynamic. Uh, and then finally, designing a, you know, a, a, a tax operating model um, in a way that accommodates that. Like the one thing, uh, I've learned a long time ago, and I always tell, you know, my team is um, we don't say no to business. I mean, the business wants to operate the way it wants to operate. Our job is to kind of figure it out, figure out the right solution, and then, you know, make sure they're making informed decisions. But we we have no illusion that we can, you know, say no to companies that are wanting to operate a particular way. So I think I think we just need to all get accustomed to um, just this this complexity, fluidity in the way uh, people operate. Um, we, we're probably going to see some of these trends remain even if, even after pandemic. Um, we're going to see, I think, executives travel less. We're going to see them attending me more meetings remotely. Um, we're going to see more global governance models where decisions are truly made at the global level by these sort of virtual communities of expertise, you know? Um, and we just need to find a way to, uh, and there's a lot of tax tools and, you know, transpricing tools available to manage that. But um, there's no simple answer. It's just this dynamic that we need to engage with companies and help them manage. Absolutely. And I think that you would also agree that we're also going to see revenue authorities across the globe continuing to be more aggressive. And just the nature of this kind of global operating model puts pressure on permanent establishment and similar other type of, and just general transfer pricing risk. And it's just something that I think we're all going to have to deal with. So uh, a, a great way to end things, Alex, thank you very much for, for joining the, the podcast. Thanks for having me, Doug. So thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks. Thank you, Alex Velashko, PwC's Value Chain Transformation Leader and partner in our Washington National Tax Services office, for joining me on today's podcast. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Leader. Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates and may sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.